including your integrated development. For this architect, it always theater, starts with a sketch. Obviously, be, it all kind of starts with the loop. Parcels of land in the future, including a, a velodrome and a youth park, which will take place over here, mm -hmm. uh, through to you know various other kind of you know sporting arenas, and the idea is that this loop can then actually rise up out of the ground and form this bridge. Jason Pomeroy brought me to the site, the Kalang Sports Hub, where he's bringing his ideas to life. I think one of the biggest issues and themes was how do you try and preserve the sense of culture of this place originally? Because once upon a time, this was an airfield. Yeah. And what we wanted to try and do was create this loop that would basically map out the original circumference of the 1930s airfield, the Kalang Airport, which would then be this means of people moving around mm. and circulating into the indoor stadium, the national yeah. stadium, the various sports and recreation facilities that take place in the future. And in doing so, not only are you enhancing the mobility of the people, but you're also giving them a cool, calm environment to do so. So lots of lush green parks mm -hmm. that augment the recreational spaces. So your intention was to make all these spaces sustainable yeah. in a way, in, where people can come together, have a conversation, Absolutely. spend time with their family. Absolutely, a really true recreational space for the people and also visitors alike. And also try and ensure that it's a cool place to be in. I mean, ultimately, greenery has a wonderful benefit in reducing temperatures, absorbing excess rainwater, mm. and that's what you need in the tropics. Mm. The plan is to transform this massive 89 hectares of space into the most sustainable sports and recreation hub in the world. Gotta ask you, any challenges taking on this massive project? Well, there are always challenges. Like Tell what? me what? Give me an example. Well, I mean, first of all, when, you've, when you're doing a master plan, yeah. there are so many different stakeholders, whether it's kind of uh, the various agencies relating to planning or water mm. or, 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 or civic infrastructure. So it's, it's kind of multiple agencies and actors in a, in a play. I like to think of it a bit like having a big orchestra okay. and, and you are having to try and be a conductor and you're needing to hear the sound of each individual kind of, mm. you know, player. And their, and their beautiful music that they're trying to create out of their solo kind of instrument. But when you bring it all together, that's what the master planner is. This master planner is an award-winning architect, author, businessman and TV host. How can we actually preserve the environment, preserve culture and still create architecture that is valued for money? A multifaceted character on one mission to advocate sustainable design. We're seeing record-breaking droughts, rising sea levels, the cataclysmic effects of 150 years of industrialization. If we don't do something now, this is going to have serious effects on the natural environment and the built environment and all our future generations. And so I only have to look at my children and I have to look at their school friends and I cannot help but feel this sense of dread and foreboding because ultimately the built environment is a huge contributor to our carbon woes. And that's why I think it's important for us to take action. So as an architect, you really want to try to make an impact, a completely, difference? Completely. I don't think that it's just about me brandishing a black pen, doing pretty pictures and saying, look at what I've done. It's more about what the process of design we can go through to ensure that the essence of the city and the building and the landscape is truly green, deep green. His works have stood out, the first zero carbon houses in Singapore and Malaysia and a Silicon Valley in Indonesia called BSD City. Well, I think that we've moved away from this kind of greenwashing, uh, thankfully. I mean, uh, for many years, uh, sustainable design and green architecture or green cities has often smacked of this idea of being expensive design, where you see these far-reaching solutions that have solar panels and wind turbines strapped to its roof, looking all very techno-centric, but people are kind of scratching their heads thinking, that's quite expensive, isn't it? Well, that's because the fundamentals were wrong. That was because the buildings were designed with all these technological advances and they suddenly stuck green stuff on the outside of it, which you is could actually see what was happening to the cost, yeah. But 
thankfully, there has been this awakening that the green agenda is actually efficient and affordable design, that by orientating cities and buildings to allow for prevailing winds to come in, providing natural light and natural ventilation, these are energy saving, water saving opportunities which will reduce the costs. We see this awakening to the idea of sustainable design not being costly design, sustainable design being economic. Hi, I'm Christine Tan and thanks for watching Managing Asia. Do check out more of our videos by clicking on the boxes on the screen. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more from CNBC International. Thanks for watching.